Hello, I'm Steph from My Driver Classic and today I'm showing you a car that you may never have seen because despite there being around 86,000 of these made, less than 100 remain. This is, of course, the Gogomobile T700, sometimes called the Isar and also sometimes called the Royal, especially when being sold in the UK. Now, this is a very interesting vehicle and one which I did quite a lot of research on before coming with the help of the owner and so I'm going to try and give you as many facts as possible today about this incredibly special car. Right, let's kick off with a walk round. The Gogomobile might be the model name but the manufacturer of this interesting little car is the company Hans Glass which I've probably just butchered the name of because it's in German but sometimes it's simply known as Glass. Without a bit of background reading, I might not have realised quite how old the company was or really the provenance of it. And in fact, the company dated way back to the 1860s when they'd been known for making agricultural machinery. In fact, they used to do it seasonally. And what they used to do was they used to make it through summer and repair it through winter. Now, it was never an enormous firm, but what they did evolved. So they carried on making the agricultural machinery. And as the 20th century rolled on, they started making cedars. And these were essentially pulled by tractors or horses. But times changed and the sales fell. And there's a lot of history in the middle here that I'm missing out in those tricky years of two world wars. You've got the Depression. I skipped over this because there's quite a lot of bits in between where they're taken over by the German government to do bits for the war effort and if I went into all that we'd be here all day but look when we get to the end of that what happens next well there was a chance trip to Italy for a farm machinery exhibition no less by the founder's grandson it was in the 1950s and he came away with an idea and what was the idea well it was scooters and scooters for the German market because They'd come back from the trip to Italy and they'd seen the brand new Vespa. And this wasn't something that was really anything in Germany. And they thought, right, we can do this. And they then made their own scooter and they called it the Gogo. And within just three years, they'd sold almost 47,000 examples. Now, these scooters and glass, glass themselves are an important part of Germany's history because they were some of the very first scooters ever made, if not the first in Germany. And they were a great means of cheap transport for Germans and they revived the company coffers, which then meant that they could move on to their next ambitious idea, which was creating a car. And the cars are made from the mid early 50s at first fell into that micro car category and as micro car fans will know micro cars did really well in Germany I mean look you only need to look at the Isetta for example now from the mid 50s when the cars were launched they did pretty well there were over 150 cars being built daily with licenses to places as far away as Australia which surprised me because I thought that micro cars wouldn't really be a thing in Australia especially not with the distances and the terrain of the time. Now within a very short space of time the Gogomobile becomes a roaring success with over 280,000 units being sold. But then things start to unravel because they bring in the Isar which is the car that we're looking at today known as the Royal um, as well for the UK market and glasses fray into the bigger car market is well not as easy. The company were ambitious forward thinkers and saw themselves taking a share of that growing market and they thought right we're going to take a risk and what they did with the first Isar prototype was they designed it with front wheel drive but actually when they got down to it and they started testing it properly they then realised it was a bit of a swine to drive and they went back to that rear wheel drive concept which they were very comfortable with but here's the thing they kind of skipped a lot of the stress testing and finding out where things were wrong and it then meant that the Isar suffered from really iffy build quality and seemingly just too many faults and people back then accepted a lot of stuff and just thought oh well, well just get on with it so it must have been pretty bad and many customers were wildly dissatisfied but look they issued them with quite a decent warranty which meant that Glass had to honour these errors and put them right which then essentially decimated a lot of the great progress and the profit they'd made through their early successors. 
But what of the eyes are? Well, as I said earlier, they made over just over 85,000 of these. I think it's around 85,600. And the vast majority were the T700, which is what we're testing here today. And they were fitted with the 682cc engine. Now, this is also called the Glass 7 glass 70 engine it's a two-cylinder four-stroke overhead valve horizontally opposed engine which is air-cooled and it kicks out 30 brake horsepower and I went a bit and did a bit of digging and got some help from the owner Simon and we uncovered the motor magazine they did a test from the early 60s and it shows the car giving a 0 to 50 mile per hour performance of 28.5 seconds and a top speed of 66 miles per hour. If you look at brochures for these that were handed out when you could buy the car, it says between 65 and 70 miles per hour as top speed. So it seems about right. Now this might seem quite slow to you at home today, but if we take one of Britain's most popular cars of the era of the late 50s, early 60s, the Morris Minor, it wasn't much sprightlier, so it's about where you'd expect it to be. Now, we talk MPG later on, and it's a bit of a bone of contention because some places quote 56 miles per gallon, as indeed does the sales brochure, but the motor magazine reckoned it was more of a low to mid 40s. But it had an incredible fuel tank, 8.8 .8 gallons. And interestingly, and great for the time, the gearbox is also really good. In fact, it's better than you might expect. It's four forward gears on this, fully synchro, and it's a Porsche synchro system, which the brochure proudly states as one of the key selling points. On your suspension for these, the setup is independent core spring to front with double acting hydraulic shocks. And then to the back, it's laminated springs with hydraulic shocks. Now the steering is ZF Gamma, which isn't something I'm really familiar with, and braking is drums all round. I'm certainly familiar with drums all round. And size-wise, if you're trying to picture this at home, it's 134.8 inches long and 57.9 inches wide. And in metric, that's 3.42 metres by 1.47 metres. But where is glass now? Well, production of glass vehicles ended in 1965 and the company was then absorbed by BMW, who just mothballed the name and have never used it since. Which, look, it's been quite an exciting story so far and that's rather a drab ending to a name which had quite an interesting story. Now, being a car from the 50s, there's not a heap of bits and pieces going on inside but that's absolutely fine because as you can probably see this layout is very beautifully put together now you're getting quite a lot of 50s cars and it can feel quite sparse but this actually is a nice bit of kit so first of all glove box as you can see in there we've got plenty of space to put all your bits and pieces and it shuts up quite nicely there as well now it sits just outside the main dash but it doesn't detract from it it doesn't feel like it's just been plonked in coming into the middle we've got an ashtray to the top which just flips down again all very neat and uniform inside there coming down into this Philips radio and then your heater controls now the heater has been disconnected I've been told because it's uh, had a few gremlins recently but look when you drive a car that's this old there will always be little bits and pieces that need sorting I feel like these are like Sistine chapels you just never get to the end of everything coming in front of you again the layout is refreshingly simple you've got a speedo there now you might have thought with this being a german car that the speedo is in kilometers it is in miles per hour again that's apparently been having a few gremlins recently coming down from there you've got your mileometer and then you've got just a couple of switches so you've got your sides you've got your main lights where they come on together you've got interior panel and then you've got your wipers there as well. And we talk about those gremlins. Unfortunately, the gremlins have taken the wipers off us today as well. So it'll probably be quite a short test drive, just so we can get a bit of a feel for the car. Coming over from there, you've got your windscreen washers. Well, we're not going to need those today. Look at the weather. They're slightly more um, excitable than the Morris Minor ones. You get a bit more water out of those. Coming down from there, you've got your choke and you've got your handbrake. And that is everything we have inside this, which 
is enough I think you've got a couple of warning lights there as well around the speedo and you've also got your indicator lights just sitting there behind the 40 miles per hour now when we were walking around we talked about how the car was initially when it came out as a concept and it was shown it was shown as a front wheel drive but of course these things change and this was one of the things that changed they took it out and they realized that actually it handled terribly and they said right you know what actually we're going to save ourselves some money and we're also going to produce a car that isn't a complete pig to drive and what they did was they turned it into a rear wheel drive but that meant that the gearing pattern then ended up a bit back to front so instead of being first second third and fourth like you might expect it actually goes first second third and then fourth with reverse over to your far left now it's worth mentioning and something that i really like about this car is it is a fully synchro box so when you talk about things like morris miners or ford anglias that came and that were quite prevalent in the 50s and even into the 60s they don't have that synchro on first this does so it should be relatively nice to drive but what does it sound like so remember we've got that 688 cc engine giving us 30 brake horse what's that get it started up it's blooming loud isn't it Have a listen from the outside and we'll take it out. Right, I'm only a bit nervous, but let's go on an adventure. Wipers came back to life, by the way, the joys of old cars. Now, as you can see, you can get up into fourth gear really quickly. And even though that gearbox pattern isn't in perhaps the formation that you might expect, you do get used to it quite quickly. And I am enjoying driving this so much. So in terms of your steering, it's not quite as precise as the Morris Minor that we took out a couple of weeks ago, but my goodness, it's light. It's very light compared to it. It's incredibly spacious inside. And this wraparound windscreen means that you've got that perfect visibility. I feel like this is almost the car that, that um, oh, what did we take out? The Metropolitan. I feel like this is almost the car that I thought the Metropolitan was gonna be. I'm really enjoying this. Although I'm not enjoying those wipers because I think we've lost them again. There we go. But as you can see here is we just trundle along. Although it's louder inside than many of its 50s counterparts, it is such a joy to drive. And because you've got so much room around you, you don't feel like you're in a very small car. Which actually leads me on quite nicely to talk about the Beetle and where that comes into this story. Now the Beetle, the idea with this was, was they wanted to create a car that essentially offered more space, especially in that boot, than the Beetle did. And I think they did a blooming good job. And some of the ideas that they've used, and you'll have seen it when we were looking at the walk around, things like where they've placed the spare wheel, the fact that the battery is tucked inside that inner wing it's just all very clever use of space that sometimes i think we don't see nowadays on cars just getting my head around that gearbox there it is relatively straightforward but occasionally when you're trying to think about where you are and what you're doing it can catch you out somewhat so overall Aside from these air and wipers that have given up on us today, I have had a jolly good time in this little Gogmobile. I came in, 
I came into the test with zero expectation. I didn't know what I was going to have. I didn't know how hard it was going to be to drive. And as a woman, and some people find this sexist to say, it's been a real pleasure to drive because some of these older cars can be quite heavy to maneuver and it ends up being more endurance than enjoyment. And I have thoroughly enjoyed this. This has been one of, despite the terrible weather, one of my favorite little drives out because I arrive with zero expectations and I leave with incredibly good thoughts about this car. It's so light on the steering, the turning circle is nice and tight, and realistically, everything about it is pleasing. From the minute you look at it and it catches your eye in a crowded field of classic cars, through to the driving experience itself. Now that's it from me today. I hope you've enjoyed watching the video. Unfortunately, we're cutting this one slightly short because the weather is against us. But until next time, take care and drive safely. Thank you.